in all of our defenses. It's an elegant mess. It's not just a mess. Could you help me with my IT stuff? My favorite thing about any kind of human is how bad they are at telling you what their problem actually is. Mm. Get to it, do it fast. Right here! On the Anycast. Make it strong, make it last. Right here! On the Anycast. Tell me more about the edge of the internet as you see it. Oh, it's such a great question, right? I mean, where where is the edge of the internet? Yeah. I know I it's mean, connected it be, somewhere to the cloud. There's the cloud and there's the edge and somehow. Yeah. And, and then there's a bunch of stuff in the middle, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so it, there's so many definitions of it. Um, you know, there's like for a while, some people thought the edge of the internet was like the cell tower, right? Um you know, there's, there's your inter, your, maybe your terrestrial wired internet access. Maybe that's the edge. There's deep edge, far edge. I think fastly CTO. So Tyler McMullen has a really great definition of the edge, which is it is whatever the location is where, uh, you as the service provider sort of naturally gain control of the handoff from your user, mm. right? Or, or you know, conversely, as a user, as an eyeball in the network, it's the point at which you lose control over your, essentially your routing policy or your forwarding policy in and out of the network. Yeah. So it's a pretty abstract definition, but I actually think it's like one of the truest definitions of edge that I've seen because it's decoupled from sort of any physical property and it more relates to the topology of the user. And yeah. I think that, you know, in 2024, in a lot of, well, if you go back 20 years, Matt, you know this, like it was all about the physical topology. We have pops and we have stuff, you know, here and there in, in modern cloud networking, at least I don't know what your experience is, but I see so many, so many inefficient latent hairpins around the internet because of the mess of networking we've made mm -hmm. over the past 20 years that, you know, the, the, the physical network looks so different than the logical network at this point yeah. that the edge is not a definition that ties to the physical nature of the network in any way. And I so mean, you need to use a logical definition instead. In, in all of our defenses, it's an elegant mess. It's not just a mess. I get, still get stuck when people talk edge compute, where everybody's definition of edge compute is different than everybody else's anyway. So we're all talking past each other no matter yeah. what. But I've sort of started to figure out that the more and more I hear about people's edge use cases and why they think they need edge, it's they're all like throughput problems that people think are a latency problem. Like it, it still comes down to at some point like transactions per second. Yep. And nobody actually cares about the speed of the transactions. They're just, they thought that was a way to get more throughput. Um, what, what is the edge? What is, what does the future look like? Like what is this new world of people trying to put apps closer to users uh, I feel like the edge is like a, is like a useless concept for kind of reason you just said, like you'll find if you actually go to our website, which is okay, it says no, it, ne it says nothing about the edge. There's just no edge compute listed because developers don't understand what that means. I think one, mm -hmm. one effect of the edge is you get things like, um, you get, you get, um, kind of thinky type people within large organizations like T-Mobile thinking, hey, oh, this seems like something we should glom onto because it makes intuitive sense, but it's not really anything most customers are demanding from them. Yeah. We, we tend to think of, I think your latency versus throughput is interesting because I think that latency and not throughput is actually what matters to our particular customers. Mm -hmm. And it's for a very specific reason, which is that um, if they can interact with their app or if a person can interact with a, with a boring rails app or a JavaScript app or whatever, and something happens within like 40 milliseconds, it feels instantaneous to them. And right. so there's this latency threshold where there is a big, like, uh, kind of usability win from applications if you can get below it and it lets developers build a lot more interesting features for right. all their applications. We, we tend to call these real-time apps, which is, again, an overloaded term, but devs tend to understand what, like, Discord is a real-time app. If I'm going to do something that has, like, features like Discord, this is kind of the category of app I'm working with then. Um, mm -hmm. And we've had, 
if you go on the tweeters and you look for us, you'll occasionally come across someone who's like, I deployed my Rails app to Tokyo. I didn't realize Rails apps could feel this fast because I've never had them this close to me before. It's mm-hmm. kind of the effect that we've noticed from people, which is very much not throughput. It's not scale at all. It's it's a it's a UX kind of quality of application metric that um, is good for us because it's like they, devs seem to intuitively understand that this will be useful. We don't have to like measure it or show our work too much. We just tell them run apps close to your users. And they're like, right either want to do it or they don't. So um, uh, that's it. You kind of work in a world where throughput is the thing. (laughs) Well, there's still, so it's interesting. There's two definitions to throughput, which is also a problem with the, (laughs) uh, and response time and latency and all of those things. So I I mostly meant that that what I mostly hear from people when they think edge compute is throughput in the uh, actual total throughput of whatever they're trying to do thing. Right. Right. We need to do X number of metrics per second, and therefore it needs to be closer to the users because that's how we're going to do X per second. Right. And uh, nothing about the throughput of the individual transactions. Oh, okay, that makes right? sense. Right. Like this, this, this transactions throughput needs to be fifty milliseconds or less, or bad thing happens. And that's where like the latency response time world starts getting fuzzy because yeah. even the way I hear you describe it, I go, oh, that's throughput, um, because. Uh, that thing that happened in 40 milliseconds, odds are, uh, I, I always, there, there are exceptions, but odds are that was some sort of JavaScript or CSS or something that happened. And all of those engines wait for the whole thing to download before it runs that thing. Ah. Uh, so until it got the whole JavaScript code, yeah, it doesn't matter how fast the first bit of JavaScript code got there. What matters is when the last bit of JavaScript code got there to run that thing, which is the time it takes to send all of the data, yes. which in my world is throughput. In ours, we I think I think one um, I think one thing we can all agree on is that most measures of latency are stupid and not mm-hmm. actually very meaningful. And like even when we talk about it, we're talking about human perception, not time to first byte. Like time to right. first byte doesn't actually mean anything. Uh, right, because there's a much fatter thing that happens, which is kind ping, of through ping at layer seven. Is, is yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, uh, or I've also started describing it as the time it takes to not serve something. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's funny. <laughs> <laughs> the time it takes to not have done anything useful yet. <laughs> I'm stealing somebody's story, and I've heard different versions of it, so I'm not the only one stealing it. But uh, the the story, the way I heard it, was that there was a new small airport opened. Uh, for commercial service somewhere in like the Gulf Coast of Florida or something like that. And there was, you know, two flights a day to Atlanta, to and from Atlanta on Delta. That was the only commercial service. Service launches. Delta's super happy with all the metrics uh, about the operations, all the metrics about, um, you know, passenger revenue, all these things. And it gets to be like, you know, end of quarter, end of year survey time. And they get feedback that this great new, um, station they launched really terrible at baggage delivery they're the only plane going to the own like and they and delta scans the bags all the way through and the, yeah the problem, and you know they the average flight on delta whatever bags get delivered in 18 minutes or 22 minutes whatever right. the number is this station was like seven like huh. it was actually on their metrics one of the top 10 performing things so naturally, what do you do when something like this happens? You call in consultants. Right. Um, and the consultants do the consulting-y thing, and the consultants come back with the solution. Solution was make the passengers walk longer before they get to the baggage claim. <laughs> so they built a maze because uh, it turns out people don't care how fast their bags take. Right. People care how long they're standing at the baggage claim waiting for their bags. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, and so, yeah, the solution was to build this little perimeter walk before they got to baggage claim. So people had to spend three minutes walking to baggage claim right. instead of four seconds. And therefore, they only had to wait for their bags for three or four minutes instead of seven or eight minutes, whatever the numbers were. That actually sounds like a pretty good outcome from hiring consultants. Like, I think I would be happy to to actually hire someone and that be the result. It's yes. like completely not intuitive. Right. Uh, you wouldn't have just guessed it. You probably wouldn't even have found that just asking a person because they don't know. Right. I think my favorite thing about any kind of human is how bad they are at telling you what their problem actually is. Mm. And that sounds like that. It's like, why are you mad? Because my bags took too long. It's like, well, no. 
<laughs> they, they were way faster than the last one you were happy with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's hilarious. A long, long, long time ago, he just said to me, he goes, look, uh, BGP is just no different than like a, a beacon that an airport would have, you know, an ILA beacon at an airport broadcasting its yeah. location um, out into the airspace. That's what BGP is for a prefix. Um, mm -hmm. You have no information about latency, congestion, throughput, link size, right? And so, you know, take BGP for what it is. A lot of people use it as a routing protocol because we have a routing decision. A generally understood, you know, vendor, somewhat vendor agreed, you know, route decision logic tree that we all use. Um, yeah, but it doesn't provide the information that we need truly to run an efficient network. And so part of the challenge of BIG is we look at that and we say, okay, yes, we have that as an element of the signal, but how do we actually get more? Right. I remember uh, the way I think of the, and I like that, and I never heard Todd give that analogy. Todd was actually our third when Barrett and I did the sort of seminal TCP Anycast presentation. Todd, it was actually the three of us because we were using Renesis data to, right. to sort of pro provide the insights. And I can't remember why, but he just like no-showed to that nano. He was like, yeah, hey, yeah, we'll, oh, we'll no. do the presentation. And then like the day before, he's like, yeah, I'm not coming. I won't be there. Um, so he was like, you know, on, on the slide deck. But um, yeah, so I, I mean, to take that analogy further, it's, it's um, you know, you have to build the air traffic control infrastructure uh, that actually gets stuff from A to B in a way that makes sense and allows for the fact that you need to space the planes and that sort of thing. But I remember my... My best, oh my God, BGP, what are you talking about, was um, years ago, there was, there was, our Anycast was going, something was going into Atlanta instead of Ashburn from somewhere that really should have gone into Ashburn on um, UUNet. So this is on 701. And eventually it got to whatever tier of technical support person Who's, who basically said, no, 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 it's working as designed. You can see here clearly we're deciding because that router in Atlanta has a lower IP address. That's why it's going there. And I was like, as designed, um, right? Like you're, you're, and they were like, yep, no, like they were implying that they had some sort of logical decision-making and how they assigned IP addresses to devices that would therefore make BGP make sense. And this, this was working as it should. And so I think at that point I gave up and went to IRC and said, <laughs> can somebody somewhere please change the can metric on this? in 701, um, please help. Well, I think, yes, I mean, isn't, me, I, but, it's been a, it's been a hot minute, but like in the decision logic, if you have equal, you know, as a tiebreaker, like isn't loopback IP in there somewhere? I think it's like number seven or it eight. It is. That's what it was. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. It, it, so yeah. we've got so how, how, how do we get you know, through like six tiers of the tree? Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And they were like, no, 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 we, this is working. See, <laughs> see, we're, we're, we're making a decision. Um, well, okay. So, and so for to the early 99% of people that we lost. I don't know if you can't do it anymore. It's probably just harder. Like if for a new person today, you like break the access, internet? no access to the wizards, uh, uh, like the wizards are a little more, a few degrees of separation removed from, from people today. That wasn't the case, uh, when everybody was starting, like we, the internet, you know, engineering space was a pretty flat corporate hierarchy back then. Is it still like, can you well, just I show up to, to a nanog today and meet the wizards? I mean, I think if you're in a work environment, there will generally be wizards mm. around or one degree of separation. And I know a lot of wizards that are still very helpful of Padawans. If you demonstrate that you're actually looking to learn, if you're like, you know, the person that's like, could you help me with my IT stuff? How do I do this? And then you try to tell them and they're like, la, 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 I'm stupid. I can't understand. Like, that's not going to work. But if you are a Padawan and you ask good questions and you come back, then I think there's still a lot of those wizards around. Now, that's a separate question is how do you break into networking? And neither of us can talk about it from an inclusive perspective, uh, you know, of, yeah. of, of, of you know, sort of because there's an awful lot of, well, whether they found a Zempic and are overweight or not, uh, you know, <laughs> old white dudes. 
There are a lot of old white dudes in networking for sure. You know, and so I don't know, you know, firsthand there, but, you know, I know a lot of people try to be welcoming uh, and Nanog itself tries to be very welcoming of members dinners and, and uh, you know, um, and, and for different groups to get together. So, you know, I, my impression is that it's still, if not easy, at least possible. Now, if you're very introverted, if you're not comfortable talking to people, um, you know, I guess it's harder but uh, I think it's, it, you know, it's a community that tries to be welcome because I think there's also concern. I mean, what happens when people, you know, Martin Levy is retired. It's like, oh, my yeah, God, the, one of the wizards is gone. There's um, a lot of there's going to be a lot of um, I don't know the polite phrase. This, yeah, there's yeah. castles popping up, popping up in the wilderness. And I do imagine he let his hair grow and has his wizard staff. And has it up in the dark. Get off my lawn. <laughs> you know, <laughs> thou shalt only approach with V6. Uh, but, but, uh, you know, I think, but actually a lot of those people are still going to Nanog and hanging out, even though they're not employed just because, you right. know, you've been with people for 30 years, then you want to, you know, still meet those people. So yeah, I think it's possible. And I, I think there's a lot of content marketing and I think it is definitely harder to be full stack. How to network your IP. This is different. Another route. So much more to talk about Gonna aim to satisfy With help from Cashfly Get to it, do it fast Right here On the Anycast Make it strong, make it last Right here On the Anycast The Anycast Podcast Brought to you by Cashfly